How many are joyful to be in the house of God today? We're joyful. Lift your hands up. Let's just praise him right now. Lord God, we thank you. We are joyful. We are grateful. We're grateful, God. We're thankful for your goodness. We're thankful for your presence. We're thankful that you're here. We're thankful for our family. We're thankful for our children. We have joy, God, because we have your spirit. We thank you, God, that you're the answer who walks around with us all the time. We thank you we never have to be in a state of emergency because you're not. We're thankful, God, that today we get to bring every care of our life. You're going to take it. We thank you, God, that you're above every problem. We thank you, Lord, that you walk on the stuff that we drowned in. We thank you, God, that you have the keys to every victory that we need. Come on, just thank him. Thank him. We got to just praise him. God is good. Shake somebody's hand next to you and say, I'm thankful. How about you? You can be seated. God bless. Welcome, everybody. And uh, bro, you had an amazing Thanksgiving. Who ate some turkey? Mm, who ate some chicken? What the heck is wrong with you? Who ate steak? Man, dear God, y'all way off balance, way off. Turkey, y'all, turkey. Hey, so I've never had fried turkey in my life, but there's a person, there's a man of God who's in here who for Christmas is going to make me a fried turkey, so I, I think it's going to be incredible. I'll repent after I eat it, but I'm going to eat it. Um, anyway, but uh, today we are continuing with the Abundance Series. Who's happy to be in church? Are you happy to be in the house of God? When I, I was glad when they said unto me. I was glad. Let's go to the house of the Lord. Why? Because in the house of God is where stuff happens. Amen. Today we're going to talk about principle number seven, obedience. You have your book right here, the eight principles to experiencing the abundant life. Powerful book. Number seven is what we're covering today, obedience. Obedience to God's word always results in experiencing the abundant life. Say it one more time. Make sure you write this down. Obedience to God's word always results in experiencing the abundant life. Exodus chapter 19 is where we're going to start, verses 3 through 8. The Bible. No other book, just the Bible. I want to say hello to everybody who's online, everybody who's watching. At this moment, the Holy Ghost is going to take over the atmosphere of your home because the Word of God is about to be spoken. Remember, every person who's sitting at home, all you need is the Word of God and the Spirit to be present, and all the power of the Godhead is available to you. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 through 8. Then Moses, talking Moses now, climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and he said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's so powerful. But he says, listen to this. He says, now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples of the earth. I want to just pause there and say, every person who's in this building is special to God. Every person who's on earth is actually special to the Lord. Can I hear an Amen. However, God actually wants to treat everyone special. But it's not up to him whether you get special preferential treatment. It's up to you. There are two kinds of Christians that are in the church. There are Christians who come to church. They barely make it into the service because they barely made it through their week. They're just surviving as a Christian. Well, they say things like this, just thank God, man, you know, I'm still here, you know, uh, made it to another Sunday, man, just, you know, just thank God I'm in the building, you know. I'm just, uh, I'm still saved, just thank God, just keep me saved, Lord, just keep me saved, that's all I ask. I know I mess up all the time, but just keep me saved. And then there are those believers who aren't just surviving, but they don't want to settle for surviving. They want to have the VIP preferential experience. I said the VIP preferential experience. And here's the deal. God is not wanting you to have it and not you. 
He's not wanting the person to, besides you to have it and you not have it. God is not trying to pick. It is actually not up to God. Let me tell you what God did for you to have it all. He was on the cross, and on the cross, he made abundance available for every single person. Every kind of abundance. He made abundance available for the health of your body. Because by his stripes, you are healed. He made abundance available for your mind, for peace. Why? Because Jesus had a crown of thorns put on his head. He had every single sinful thought, every single area of every kind of despicable, gross, grotesque thought put in his mind so your mind could be called the mind of Christ. Jesus on the cross opened up his life. He took sin, every sin you've ever done. I'm talking the ones you don't tell anybody about. All of those that you want to keep hidden. Maybe even you've still never told anybody about it because you're just happy that it's over. That's a, those kind of sins. I mean, you didn't tell your wife about it. You haven't told nobody. He knows every single one of those. The Bible says that there's not one thing in the darkness or the light the eyes of God have not seen. But he took every single one of those sins and he actually didn't just take it upon himself. He became sin. He became the essence of sin. So much so that his father had to turn his back on his own son. So that God would not turn his back on you when you call out to him. Jesus through the cross has given everybody the opportunity for abundance. However, it is not God's fault if you're not living it. You are the one who chooses whether you want to be a special treasure. Your obedience puts you in the place of VIP preferential treatment. Man, people talk all the time, Gavin, man, you're just so blessed. And man, I go all over the world. And when I've been preaching for the last 20 some odd years, I had to go to preach. And people are like, man, you just, you just got such favor on you, man, everything you do. I, I said, well, you know, honestly, man, God's good to me. He's merciful. I've made mistakes too. But eventually I get up and I obey. You, you got you to gotta stop going around the mountain. You see, the Israelites were supposed to be taking a journey for 40 days. It took them 40 years. Why? Because they wouldn't learn their lesson. And every time you don't learn a lesson, God says, take another lap. They wouldn't learn their lesson. And every time you don't learn the lesson, he said, you're going to have to go around this mountain again. Take another lap. You can move states. You can say, well, they don't understand me at this church, you know, and I'm just going to go over to this one where they're going to use my gifts. God just says, take another lap. I'll teach you the same lesson there because you didn't learn it here. You got to learn it there. Some people, they move states. They'll move whole countries. They'll be like, man, you know, because they're hoping that God will restart and forget about the thing they need to obey in. So if I move, if I move countries, then God won't talk to me about this no more. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter if it's India. It don't matter if it's Africa. They'll just speak to you in their language, teaching you the same lesson you wouldn't learn in San Bernardino. You just keep taking more laps. But here's the problem with taking too many laps. Your body parts start falling off. Pretty soon you can't walk like Jesus no more because you got a limp. You've taken too many laps. You don't know where to go anymore. Pretty soon your eyeballs start falling out. You can't see Jesus anymore. You can't see in the spirit anymore. You've taken too many laps. Pretty soon your ears start falling. You can't hear the voice no more. God, are you speaking to me? I, I don't know where you're at. You've taken so many laps. The Bible says Paul talks about a conscience that gets seared. After hearing the voice of the Lord so many times, if we continue to not heed it, if we continue to ignore it, what happens is our conscience is like a hot iron and it sears it. You're not sensitive anymore. All of a sudden, you're starting to call sins. You used to say, that's horrible. I'll never be part. All of a sudden, you're starting to say, well, it's just who I am. God made me this way. If he didn't want me to do this, he wouldn't have made me this way. Are you kidding me? Seared conscience. You can't, even, you can't even tell darkness and light. You're calling darkness the light and the light the darkness. You're saying a man's a woman and a woman's a man. There is actually one truth. There is not a relative truth. There is one truth. His name is Jesus. Truth has a name. I said truth has a name. Truth has a name. I am the way. I am the truth. What I say goes. It's the truth. There is actually, no, nah, no. Nah, you don't have to sit around and argue like, well, your truth is awesome and my truth is over here. And you know what? You just have your truth and I'll have my truth over here and we'll just get along and have a happy part. 
Yeah, you're going to be dancing in your deception because you're dancing on the brink of hell. You're dancing on the brink of hell. Jesus actually made the truth very clear. He put it in his word. He lived out the truth because he was the truth walking. He was the truth. When he spoke, it was the truth. If you want to eat my flesh, drink my blood, follow me. How would you have liked to have been Peter? That was not a popular sermon. Peter would have not put that at the top of the sermons that Jesus preached. He would have said, Jesus, you could have left that one alone, you know, because it said many left. And then he looks at Peter and said, you going to go too? Are you going to leave? <laughs> Peter says, where else am I going to go? Lord, I don't like what you're saying. I would have preferred you didn't say it. But who else has the words of life? I don't like how you're correcting me right now, Lord. I don't like it that I'm still single right now because you still know I got lessons to learn. I don't like it that I got to still mature a little bit. I don't like it the way you're treating me, but who else? I'm sticking with you, Jesus, because you are the truth. I'm going to go through this process. I'm not going to short circuit my journey. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to learn my lesson. Is there any Christians in here who don't just want to survive, but they want the VIP experience? Listen, this is not a, a prosperity thing. I'm not trying to, the VIP experience, oh, okay. No, the Bible says you can distinctly distinguish yourself from even other Christians. Not everybody's obeying. That's why not everybody's receiving the blessing. Everybody's in this service listening, but you're making the mistake that just because you heard the sermon, you're gonna be blessed. Watch what God says at the end of the scripture. He says, so Moses returned from the mountain and he called together all the elders of the people and he told them this word and all the people responded. Listen to this. They responded together. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. You see, it doesn't change you just because you sat in this building. <laughs> you could be a car sitting in a car lot. Doesn't mean anybody's ever going to drive you. You could, you, you get to hear, I mean, how many sermons do you think you heard? How many notebooks do you have on your mantle at home next to your bed of sermon notes that you've written down from Pastor Marco? Here's my real question. How many of you obeyed and responded to? Because the blessing is not released because you heard it. The blessing is released in your response to it. You see, you're going to hear this sermon today, and you could go home, and everybody online, you could shut off this, you know, around 12, 15, 12, 20, and go, oh, that was a great service, and, you know, I'm going to go and eat my leftovers, and you can get on with the rest of your life, or you could be smart and get out a pen and paper or a phone and say, Lord, these are the areas you've been convicting me on. These are the things you've been talking to me about, and I'm not going to wait one more day to obey. I'm not going to, you see, because here's the deal, procrastination is a devil, and it's stealing from many of you procrastination you know what you're supposed to do you already know what God's been telling you but you just say you know I'll do it tomorrow you know that's what Pharaoh said Moses came to Pharaoh said deliver my people he said yeah 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 he shows them the snake does it all said yeah yeah I'll do it tomorrow you see delayed obedience is still disobedience you see because you don't understand if you don't obey now there might not be another change you're gonna have to wait a whole nother cycle before the opportunity comes again some of y'all don't know that the season God is speaking is the only season you can do the thing that you're supposed to be doing right now. But you take it for granted. You're like, you know, you know, I'll just, you know, God knows my heart and I'll just come back to it. But you got to understand, you can't do the same thing at 70 as you can do at 20. There, there are just things you can't do at 80 years old that you could do at 25. There are places, there's, there's things, you see, there are seasons of your life and you got to get with God in season. You got to be in the stride. You got to get into the momentum of obedience. What do you mean the momentum? Well, just think about the momentum of addiction. There's a momentum to addiction. There's a momentum to disobedience. Think about that. You do one thing, you go to the wrong place. What does that lead to? Meeting the wrong people? It's a momentum. Getting to getting the wrong results, right? There's a momentum. There's a pattern to it. It's the same with obedience. You get in the right place of repentance. All of a sudden, God puts you in front of the right people. He puts you into the right situation. You get a blessing. Now, listen to what God says. This is so powerful. He says, if you'll keep my covenant, you'll be my own special treasure. And then he has to have this qualifying statement. I love this. For all the earth belongs to me. He said, I have a right to say this, Moses, 
Because everything is already mine. Do you know who you're serving? Do you know who this God is? Have you thought about the hands of God? Well, if I get to put my hand, my life in the hands of God, I don't know. Like, this God, do you know what the hands of God have carried? You got to see the hands of God reaching down into the dirt. And the hands of God are forming in the dirt the husk of what would be a man. I see those hands and fingers reaching down. And then I see them blowing into the nostrils of man. Man blowing out the borrowed breath from God and became a living being. I'm seeing those hands taking the stars, the Bible said. And he took the galaxies and stars and he put them in his hands. And he flung them. The word is flung. He flung them out. Like juggle them like dice. And the galaxies all fell into a perfect spot that if the sun would move even one degree to the left or right, we'd burn up or freeze. Those hands, do you know what those hands have done? I see those hands going with, with, with Moses. And Moses with his staff, listen to this, this is so powerful. It says that Moses is in front of the Red Sea. And God tells him, I want you to get up off your face because this is what we do. Moses is in front of the Red Sea, and he begins to cry out, and he says, Lord God, help us. Lord God, we don't know what to do. And this is what God's response is. What are you doing crying out to me? You already know what to obey. Get up. Take up your staff. You see, some of y'all are crying out, but you're doing it because you're trying to ignore what God's already told you. You don't need to pray about it anymore. You need to just get up. You need to get the staff. Now watch this. Watch this. He says, go out and open the waters. What does he have to do? Listen, there's always a part you have to play, and then there's a part God plays. Your part, watch what Moses has to do. Look how hard this is. How hard is that? He's got to lift a stick. Every single miracle that happened in Egypt, the frogs didn't come, the flies didn't come until he lifted a stick. Because God isn't asking for something you don't have. He's asking for something you already have, and he just wants you to surrender it. So he takes it. Watch this. This is so powerful. He takes the stick. Look at this obedience. This is dedicated obedience. And it says that, and, 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 and here's the way we read it. He lifts up his stick and parts the Red Sea. But theologians have actually gone into the story. When I went to Israel, I found out what really happened. He lifts up the staff, and then he begins to walk in the water. Look at this. It's up to his ankles but it hasn't parted yet. It's now up to his knees. It still hasn't parted yet. But he knows what obedience will do. Obedience will open any water. You just gotta wait for it. So he goes deeper. It's now up to his waist. It still hasn't broken yet. What theologians believe that it got all the way up to almost his mouth before the water opened. What does that mean? That means that Moses understood something that we need to understand. Your obedience will command any boundary in front of you to clear out and open. The water opens. Can you imagine? See, here's the deal. Y'all are in obedience, but nothing's happened yet. I want to tell you, just take another step. Just take another step. I know the water hasn't parted yet. I know your kids don't seem like they're all better yet. But you stay in obedience because obedience demands... Everything's mine. The hands of God came down and they opened up that sea. I hear Job saying, do you know those hands? Job said that God looked at nothing. Watch me. I'm shaking nothing. I'm not touching anything. Even though there's electrons and, and neutrons that are in the atmosphere right now that I'm foiling with right now. It's just air to me. You don't see anything here. But God looked at this and he said, that's a great place to hang the world. And he hung the world on nothing. Do you know who the God is that you're serving? Do you know the hands that are in? If he says you can be blessed, you're going to be blessed. If he says if you obey, you're going to get it, you're going to get it. So, he says if you'll keep my covenant, this is so great. Covenant, two definitions. Number one, an agreement between two parties. A covenant is agreement between two parties. It's a legal contract. Somebody say contract. Requiring certain actions to be carried out by both parties. The contract is made ineffective the moment one or both parties don't fulfill their part. So God says, I have a covenant with you, a contract. As long as you do your part, I do my part. 
God will not do your part, and you can never do God's part. What am I talking about? Well, David, remember David? Said that he got the sling, and he said he was practicing in private. And he said he slayed a bear and a lion when nobody was looking. You see, Goliath was a promotion for David, but David did not earn the giant of Goliath until he won some private battles. David had to win some private victories when nobody else was watching in order to earn the promotion of Goliath. Goliath wasn't a bad thing in David's life. Goliath was the greatest thing that ever happened to him because through Goliath, he got a throne. But he did, what did he do? It said that he got that sling and Goliath is shouting at him and it said he doesn't, listen, this is so powerful. David said he ran at Goliath. Why? Because he knows the Lord is on my side and if I obey what he tells me to do, I don't care how, I, size is just a number. So watch what he does. He slings it. This is his part. Now, Goliath was wearing a helmet that was two inches thick. We all know the rock ends up in his head. But the rock had to go fast enough in order to go through two inches of metal and get in his head. So the rock had to be traveling over 230 miles an hour. Now, here's the deal. If you've ever seen a long drive contest, the big guys, they're hitting 450 yards. They're screaming when they hit the ball. Ah! Like, like they lift in weights, they're jacked. Ah! You know, that ball is going about 216 miles an hour. They're hitting 450 yards. It's a supernatural thing God did. David did his natural part. God made it go fast enough to go through the helmet and hit the mark. The Bible says in the book of James, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Laying hands is your part. They'll recover, that's God's part. But here's the deal, if you don't lay hands, they don't have a chance to recover. God will not do your natural part, and this is what I wanna tell you, your part is always natural. It's always natural. You are never gonna be asked to do something supernatural. You're only gonna be asked to surrender what you already have. Take your hands, put them over there, you're my body. If you don't walk over there, the body can't walk over there. Jesus is the head, we are the body, are you hearing me? Jesus is the head, we are the body. So if the body is the arms and legs, you're not looking at my head and saying, this is Gavin, and then you look here and say, this is Christian. This is Gavin, this is Gavin. It's all me. So when you see, when it says Jesus took over the dragon and, and the end of Revelation and, and all that, he's talking about the church. We are his hands and feet. We're not separated from it. We're his hands and feet. So if you don't walk over there and speak, Jesus can't walk over there and speak. If you don't go and lay hands, how is Jesus going to touch them? You see, it's actually not about you. It's just about you obeying your simple part so God can do his amazing part. So there's a contract, and every contract has this thing called a clause. Somebody say clause. It's got a clause, okay? Every contract has clauses. Clauses are specific stipulations or demands that make the agreement work. If you don't follow the specific stipulations, the contract is canceled. So lawyers will get with you and they will get a contract in their hands and they'll say, listen, you can't skim over this. Do not sign anything that you haven't read every word, right? Why? Because they don't want you to sign your life into something you don't fully understand. Because if you don't know what your part is to play, you're not going to get the benefits of what you're thinking you are. But we get the book of life called the Bible, and we're skimming over the book. We're not reading the fine print. We get the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be one. He makes me lie down and bring your Oh, that's a good one. I know that one. I know that one. Uh, I got four more minutes. Okay, Matthew uh, 6. Oh, yeah, seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all will be added. Oh, I love that one. I love that one. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I got two more minutes. John 3, 16. I know this one. I don't even have to look at it. <laughs> For it. I know that one by heart. You're skimming the book of life, but you're not reading the fine print, so you're not catching the clauses. Everybody wants the blessings, but nobody wants to fulfill the if. There is a stipulation and condition for every promise. There's over 75, listen, there's over 7,500 promises in the Bible. Every one of them is a door to a blessing. But every one of them have a stipulation and condition so that you can get in the door. So 
A clause is very, very important because if you don't read the fine print, you'll be expecting something from God, but you haven't done your part, but you get mad at God for 20 or 30 years of being a Christian, but you just never learned what your part was to play and you don't think God loves you. So we got these doors called blessings and promises. And on the other side of this door is the promise, the promise of peace. You got peace of mind. No more anxiety attacks. No more nightmares when you sleep. On this side of the door is a breakthrough in your finances. You're never going to worry about these things again. You're not going to be worrying about your debts ever again because all you're worried about is paying off other people's. There's a place for that. There's a place of blessing that you want to get to. But on this side is where you're at. Now, this is powerful, 2 Corinthians 1.20. I got to read this to you. It said that the promises of God... All in Jesus are yes and amen. So here's the deal. Over 7,500 times God says yes to you. Over 7,500 promises, over 7,500 yeses from God. I think that's something to be excited about. Over 7,500 yeses from God. Some Christians only are complaining because they don't think God ever listens to them. And all God ever says to me is no. There's over 7,500 chances for blessing. Okay? But here's what we do. We go up, man, I am a friend of God. Woo! Because we sing that song. But they don't read the stipulation. The Bible says the friends of God are only those who fear him. So not everybody in this building is a friend of God. He loves you, but you're not a friend. It's only those who fear him. But we're all, I am a friend. There's a stipulation. There's a condition. You got to obey God when he says it, whether you want to or not. You got to obey God whether it benefits you or not. You got to obey God immediately, not delayed. You got to, the fear of God. So here's what we do as Christians. We go up to the door reading about the blessings. I came up and I said a prayer. I came up to the altar. I'm part of the Wayworld Outreach. I've been through Holy Warriors 1 and 2. I'm going on 3 right now. I'm walking up to that door. Watch what we do. We come up and we say, all right, you guys ready? I'm about to be blessed. Bless, bless. You're shouting about it all service. And then you get to the door. Uh, <laughs> just a moment. God. Lord. Hey. <laughs> it's me. Your beloved. Your favorite. Your friend. And you get confused. What is going on? Uh, Pastor Marco's so blessed and he's so blessed and she's so blessed, but I ain't got none of this. What's going on? I, they have the abundant life, but when am I going to ever experience this? What's happening? You get angry at God and you get upset with the Lord and it's all yes, but Jesus is on the other side and this is what he's saying. Find the key. Just go get the key. There's a key for your family. A key of breakthrough for your children. There's a key that opens up the breakthrough for your finances. There's a key that opens up the breakthrough for peace. Never having any more anxiety attacks. Never going to sleep with nightmares. There's a key for your sleep. You can take over your sleep. You don't have to worry about sleep anymore. There's a key for the healing of your body. There's a key. Every key is written in the contract. It's the if clause. There's an if for every blessing. If you do this, you get the blessing. Let me read you a couple examples. How about salvation? Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? If you openly, if you openly declare and believe in your heart. So what happens if you don't openly declare and you don't believe in your heart? You're not Great job. Great job. Let's go to the next one, okay? How about this one? Revelation 3.20. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, that word hear means pay attention to me, turn off distractions, and open the door, I'm going to come in and we're going to share a meal together. So if you pay attention to the Lord's voice and open the door, what happens? He comes in. But if you don't pay attention to his voice, what happens? He doesn't. He doesn't come in. How about forgiveness? None of us want to keep our shame and our guilt. We love the blessing of forgiveness. Every single one of us wants the blessing of forgiveness because I don't know about you, but I don't want my past to still be on me. I want to be cleansed of that sin. Look what the Bible says, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. So what happens if we don't confess our sins? You're not going to be cleansed. 
Do you see that every blessing has a stipulation? It's called the if clause. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive you. The only unforgivable sin is unforgiveness. You want that blessing? Here's the key. You ready for the key? Forgive everybody who's hurt you. You want to go through that door? You want that blessing? Forgive them. Take the key of forgiveness. Open up the door. Let them go. You want the blessing of peace? Look at what Isaiah 26 verse 3 said. This is powerful. This is Isaiah uh, 26 3. You will keep him in perfect peace. All who trust in you, look, and whose thoughts are fixed on you. You know the reason you still don't have peace? It's because the only person you're not focusing on is Jesus. You're focusing on your mother-in-law. You're focusing on your sister. You're focusing on your brother. You're focused on everybody else. But there's a key to peace. The key is keep your mind fixed on Jesus. Keep Jesus at the forefront. If you'll take that key, you can open the door and there's peace. I'll do one more. How about your finances? Some of y'all need some serious breakthrough. Some of y'all are in hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Let's watch what the Lord says to this. I'm not bringing that. This is all still part of the Bible. Same book. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in your house. Now look what the Lord says. Test me in this. Okay? If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Listen, guys. He did not say that he's going to open the window of your house. He didn't say you're going to open up the window of your auntie's house. He didn't say I'm going to open up the window of Pastor Marco's house. I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. Do you know what's in heaven? Maybe you're not acquainted with what's in heaven. Let me tell you, in heaven there are body parts that are up there. For people who need legs down here, you can pull it out and a leg can grow out here on earth. There are eyes up there for people who are blind down here. There are eyes up there you can replace the eyes. There are ears that can heal deaf ears. There are body parts up in heaven. There is, there is peace. There is no weeping. There is no crying. There is no anxiousness. There is nothing like that in heaven. And he's saying, I'm going to open up the bank up here. I'm not going to open up the bank down there. I'm going to open up the storehouses of what I got up here. You see, obedience, listen, demands for heaven to open. Jesus went down and was baptized by John the Baptist. And the Bible said he went into the water. And when he broke open the water, when he came out, the Bible says that the heavens opened and God spoke. You see, it wasn't Jesus who made heaven open. It was his obedience that made heaven open. He said to John the Baptist, when John the Baptist was arguing, he said, I got I to gotta baptize you. He said, no, 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 no. I have to obey all that God requires. And when he went down, he broke open the water and heaven broke open the same time. You see, the word is this. When it says open, it means it rent. It means it's a violent ripping apart. In other words, heaven did not have a chance whether it wanted to open or not. It didn't have a decision. His obedience put such a demand on God's voice. God doesn't have a choice to talk. He wants to talk to you, don't get me wrong. But he doesn't have a choice to or not if you obey. His voice is going to be all over your life. You're not going to be wondering, where do I go? Where's the direction and all this? An obedient person doesn't wonder. An obedient person knows. He's going to open heaven. He's going to rip it open. Your obedience demands the opening of heaven. This is so good. See, there's always a part for us to play. But here's what I want to say. Some people just want miracles. Let me get into this. Some people just want miracles. Listen, I know you need a miracle in your finances. So what does God do? He gives you an offering. You need a miracle in your kids. What does he do? He gives you an offering. Well, Gavin, that's convenient for you to say because you're part of the way world outreach. You're not getting it. God gives you opportunities to be blessed. He's not trying to get anything from you. He's trying to get something to you. He's trying to bless you. He's trying, but he needs you to obey. Here's the deal. If there's any area, and this is what I want to say, this is the main lesson right now. If there's any area of your life that you need a blessing in, you don't have the blessing, marriage, find it, whatever it is, you simply need to find something to obey. Did you, did you hear me? Can you, can, will you hear me over here? If there's an area of your life 
that you need a blessing in. I don't care what it is. You simply need to find something in the contract to obey. You need to find an if clause. You need to obey it, and the blessing will not have a choice but to attack you. You need to be finding something to obey. You see, people's lives who are all like, man, I know what I'm doing in five years. That's boring. Yeah, I got the plans. I got, you know, it's all working for you. Your life is boring. Because a life with God, yeah, you do have peace, but you're constantly finding something else to obey because there's a blessing you haven't obtained yet. There's a breakthrough you haven't attained yet. You always know there's more. There's always more. So you're looking for the next thing to obey. This is a different kind of life. This is a different kind of Christian. Christians who are obedient, obsessed. I'm obsessed with obedience. That's what Jesus was. He said, I got to do all that God requires. I'm not going to leave one thing out. I'm obsessed with fulfilling it all. The Bible says that Jesus walked on earth and he fulfilled over 330 prophecies just while he walked on earth. He fulfilled every single one, y'all. Every single one. But some just want miracles. Let me talk to you about miracles real quick, and then we're going to close. Miracles are awesome. Of course, I love miracles. I am a miracle. I'm a miracle walking. I was blind. I had water inside of my lungs and my brain. I had severe muscle atrophy I could not control. I was supposed to be in a wheelchair my entire life. Of course, I'm a miracle. I'm a walking, healed miracle. I know it. I love miracles. Don't get me wrong. Who here has experienced a miracle? A miracle. Only God could have done it. Look at that. It's beautiful. And will God continue to do miracles? Of course, because he's the God of miracles. But your mentality should not be a miracle mentality. Let me tell you why. Because miracles are for this. Emergencies. Miracles are when you literally have done everything you can. And unless God shows up, you're not, it's not going to happen. But you don't want to be living in a continual state of emergency. And a lot of, I can't tell you how many times I've been with pastors. This is the, the, well, probably one of the number one things. I travel around the world and I preach. And the reason why I go is because of miracles. But after the services, I cannot tell you how many pastors have sat with me at t tables for dinner or whatever. And they've said these words. Man, Gavin, we just got to teach our people that miracle mentality again. Like, we just got to bring, you know, miracles back to the forefront. And we just got to, and I understand what they're saying. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I say, but pastor, no. They're like, what, what do you mean? I can't, and I've, I've always said it very respectfully. The pastor, you don't need to teach your people how to live in the state of an emergency. You need to teach them how to live in the blessing. <laughs> There's a difference. Miracles are for people who are consistently lazy and they're depending on the mercy of God. Here's the deal about mercy. Here's the deal. Mercy is up to God. You can't control it. It said he'll give mercy to who he wants to, and he won't to who he won't. It's not something you control. However, you can control the blessing. Obedience controls the blessing. If you want to live a life in the blessing, live a life in obedience. And then everything's going to happen in your life. Let me tell you why. Because we are not called to live in this way, but live in the blessing. The blessings are a result of obedience. If you're needing a blessing, look for something to obey in that area of your life. Okay, so here's the last thing I'm going to say. This is so good. Philippians 2. Though he was God, play that, play that track, please. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. This is Jesus. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. And was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself, listen, in obedience to God, even to the obedience of the death on a cross. Therefore, look at the result of his obedience. God elevated him to the highest place of honor. And he gave him a name above every single name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth. Wow. And every tongue declare that Jesus is Lord. You see, Jesus obeyed. He didn't come to be served. He humbled himself to obedience to death. And because of his obedience, he was inaugurated in the book of Hebrews. He was inaugurated as the king of the universe. And he was given the name of every name. Above every single name. Obedience, even though it might seem difficult when you do it, 
is the smartest decision you can ever make because you are demanding a blessing. What is it that needs help right now? Is it your kids? Your family? Your finances? Are you in an emergency at the moment? Don't feel bad. I just want you to know there's a key. It's waiting for you in the text of that Bible. There's keys. They're waiting for you, and the doors are already open. And listen, God has already said this. This is good news. He's already said yes. Every promise in God is yes and amen. When he died on the cross, he said, it's finished. My part is over. You got to find the key. Just go get the key. I'm waiting for you on the other side. I'm ready with a blessing. You see, you got to get practical about the Bible. You, you, you can't keep it ethereal. It can't be something that you just hear and gets churchy about. You just need to be practical. The Bible is a very practical book. There are in the Bible over 7,500 doors that have a blessing on the other side. There are over 7,500 keys. Today, I'm challenging you and asking you, are you skimming over the contract? Or have you looked at your part to play? Because remember, if you'll play your part, God will always play his part. Listen, we're having an offering on the 10th. This is important. And this, honestly, everybody should give something. But there's some of you who really honestly are in a place, seriously, where you're in an emergency. You're in an emergency. You need God seriously to touch you. This is an opportunity. We're not going to look and be like, oh, how much did you give? And, oh, it, that's not. God between you and him, the Bible says, determine in your heart with the Lord how much you should give. Here's the deal. You could just bring an offering. You could do that. Or you could make it a seed for a harvest in the exact area you need to be. You see, we put a prayer request on these. Why did we do that? Because you should point your seed and make it specific. You shouldn't just give an amount. You should put a seed toward a specific need. Put a seed toward a specific need. What is the need? Because that determines how your seed should be. If it's a marriage, you should pray about it. What's the seed? If it's your kids, if it's your business, what's the seed? God is trying to get you the blessing because he already said yes, but there's a key. Give, and it will be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. God says, I'm ready to outgive somebody, but I need you to do your part. I'm ready to outgive you, but I need you to do your part. Listen, y'all, everything that's money goes. Here's the thing about this church. Can I say this? I, I'm not like everybody else on staff because I've actually been at other churches for the last 20 years, okay? And I've seen how they take offerings, if I could be very honest. I've seen the way that people do church. And let me tell you, the majority of churches do not actually say what they're gonna give the money to. So what does that do for you? You wonder what the money's gonna go to. Pastor Marco has just told you, we're going to tell you for the rest of the month, exactly, you've been seeing every offering moment. The money has gone to the women's home. The money is going to this kid. The money is going to food. You'll know exactly, this is powerful. I'm telling you, you don't get this in every church. Don't take that for granted. There is complete transparency about what's happening. That we're going to build a place on the cafe and have a room. Now, whether or not you think that's a good use of money, it doesn't matter. Remember this. When you plant a seed, God blesses you. Doesn't it, it, here's what I've told people. Honestly, even if you, you got to hear this. Even if you were under a corrupt leader, I've said this to people all over the world. Even if you were under somebody who was corrupt, you didn't know where the money was going to because listen, y'all, I've had pastor friends who are literally embezzling the money from churches and spending it over tax. I've had, I'm telling horror stories. But here's the deal. Those people who tithe were living in the blessing. Why? Because God does not look at where your things go. He's looking at the obedience of your heart. Listen, you can be in the midst. Remember Abraham? This is, remember Abraham? Abraham and Lot, remember him? Lot is in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. God has to come and speak to Abraham. Look at this. And he says, I'm going to destroy this city. You got anything you want to say? Abraham said, yeah, you, yeah, wait a minute. Lot's in there. Can you take it down to 50? And then can you take 45? And then, you know, he talks them all the way down to 10 people. You know why? Because 10 people was about how many was with Lot. But God couldn't even find 10 people. Now here's the difference. Here are two different kind of Christians. Lot is in the midst of a catastrophe about to happen. And he doesn't know what's coming. But he's a believer. 
He believes in Jehovah. Abraham believes in Jehovah as a believer as well. But he knows what's coming before it happens. Because God is able to set you apart in the midst of even the crowd that you're with. There are people in this building who are people who love God. Hopefully every single person. But then there's people who show their love by their obedience. And they have VIP preferential treatment. God wants us all to be there. Listen, Abraham and uh, Lot were both believers. One knew what was coming before it happened. The other was about to be a part of the catastrophe. But God sent mercy. Listen, be a person who knows the secrets of God. Psalm 25 says this, verse 14. The secrets of the Lord are with those who fear me. Those who obey me, I will give my secrets. You'll know what's going to happen before it happens. You'll know what's happening. You don't have to be introduced by a president. You don't have to know what's happening with the economy. God's already given you the strategy of heaven. He's already told you what's going to happen, what's going to shift. You're never surprised. This is a life available for you. It's exciting. And listen. It's one obedience away. It's one obedience away. Every eye closed, please. I want to ask you right now. Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is here. Thank you for respecting this moment. Thank you guys for being seated and respecting this moment. This is beautiful. I stand at the door and I knock. If you'll hear my voice, he's knocking on some of your hearts right now. And open the door. I'm going to come in. He's going to change your life. If you say, Gavin, that's me. I cannot go another moment without knowing Jesus. I got to know him right now. We cannot end this service without this. You are the most important thing right now. There is nobody more important than you. We love you. We are here for you. This is the moment we were all waiting for. Heaven is bending over right now, waiting to celebrate you. If you say, man, Gavin, I want to give my life to the Lord. Put your hand up, please, right now. One, two, three. I want to do it. Thank you. Put those hands up. I see him. I see him. I see him over here. Keep him up high. Keep them up high. Every person, you say, I want to have peace with God. I need to have peace with God. Come on, lift your hands up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you just stand where you're at right now? I promise I'm not going to embarrass you. Stand up. If you're lifting your hand, stand up right now where you're at. Give them a hand. Come on. Give them a hand. Stand up where you're at. Altar team, please come up. Stand up where you're at. If that's you, just stand up where you're at. Everybody else, thank you for this respect. If you say, you know what? That's me. I'm seeing your faces. This is so beautiful. I see people in the back. I see people right here. Y'all two right here? You guys a couple? What a beautiful day for y'all. Are you guys rededicating your life or doing it for the first time? First time? Wow, man. Congrats, y'all. Everybody, give them a hand as they all come up. Come on up right now. Walk up. Let's pray with somebody right here. Let's walk up. Man, powerful couple right here. God's got a plan. Come on, give them a hand as they're coming up right now. Give them a hand as they're coming up. Jesus is so good. Come on, they're still coming from the back here. Pray. Come on, give my hand. Give my hand. Let's praise him. I'm going to say a prayer. The prayer we're all going to say together. And then I'm going to pray over everybody who's here. I'm going to pray for a fresh wind of strength to follow through. I'm going to do that in just a moment. You're going to need this prayer. Let's pray all together. Say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying on the cross. Raising from the dead. Thank you for your blood that you shed for me. I'm now saved. I'm going to heaven because you made a way. You're the boss. I'm not. From this moment on, I give over ownership. And I want to be a disciple. Make me a disciple. I forgive myself. I let my sins go. And I receive your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, would you turn around right now? Would you give a hand for all of our new brothers and sisters? Give a hand for all of our new brothers and sisters. What's up, man? Bless you guys. Wow. They're going to be praying with you and give you something. But every other person, would you stand up? I want to pray a blessing over you right now. Every other person, stand up. I'm going to pray a blessing over you right now. Specific prayer for you. If you lift your hands up, please, as you stand up, lift your hands. Receive this. Here's a promise. Here's a door. I'm going to give it to you. This will change your life if you listen to it and you act on it today. Philippians 2.13, one of my favorite of all time. God is working in you, giving you the power 
and the desire to do what pleases him. What does that mean? Every person looking at me, hands lifted. It means that even though you've wanted, many of you have wanted to change. Many of you have wanted to obey, but you didn't have the power of follow through. I'm praying for you right now because there is a power to follow through on what God has told you to do. You don't have to live in the same cycle. Every person with your hands raised, would you receive it right now? Let's pray. I believe in the name of Jesus. I extend out the power of Almighty God. And I say if you are listening to my voice, the Holy Spirit is working in you. I believe he's spoken to you. And I thank you in Jesus' name that right now you are having the power to not just listen to what he says, but you will follow through in Jesus' name. Obedience is your destination because abundance is your location. Thank you, Lord God, right now in the name of Jesus. I bless you with strength. I bless you with follow through. You will not self-criticize yourself anymore. Stop it. There's some people right now, you're, you're, I can literally listen to your thoughts. You're literally criticizing and demeaning yourself. You're saying, I've tried this before. It's never worked. Listen, God who began a good work in you will not stop until it is completed. Receive his strength right now in the name of Jesus all over this building. Receive the strength of God. Come on, just look at him and say, Lord, I receive it. Lord, I receive it. God, I receive follow through. Come on, tell him, I receive follow through. I receive follow through. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to follow through in obedience. And God, I thank you that the blessings will not be withheld. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Pastor Christian, if you want to come on up, God bless you all. Thank you so much. I pray it was powerful. I pray you were blessed today. Tell somebody about this word. Crossroads is this Wednesday as well. God bless. Come on, how many were blessed by that word today? Let's give God some praise. We love you, church. Don't forget, Wednesday, this Wednesday, Crossroads is happening here. It's a chance for your family and friends to get a message and to get saved. And for all the ladies, this Friday is the last women's service of the year with Penny Cruz at 7 p.m. We love you so much. God bless you. If you need prayer, come forward. We'd love to pray with you. But if not, you are dismissed. We love you. And remember, if God is for you, there's no one who can come against you. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We love you.